portfolio is. So, I think most people would agree with the top statement that is the application of computing technologies to biological information would be a reasonably high level definition of what bioinformatics is. But when you start drilling down into what you mean by that, you end up getting a whole lot of different ideas. And this is just some of them. It's not comprehensive, and I'm sure you can add to this. But in discussion with council members, my colleagues, etc., these are some of the ones that come up, especially for NHGRI, which is the development of new methods and algorithms, the use of existing methods, development of laboratory information management systems, processing of biological data or pre-processing the data, development of analysis pipelines and using and developing different environments, and curation and collation of and representation of biomedical data. I would also say that some people will include health, electronic health records in here and a variety of other things. The key thing here is that this means many things to many people. So in the context of what I want to do here, I'd like to be able to give you an understanding of at least the way we see this at NHGRI from our perspective. It doesn't mean it's complete or comprehensive. It's our first attempt at trying to do this. So this is why I've called this version point one. And this is an attempt to look at a high level view of what we do within the bioinformatics program and to give you an idea of how we actually view that and our perspectives based on that very broad definition that I gave you just a moment ago. So in the context of today, what I'm going to do is give you an idea of what we're going to cover. I'm going to cover two main areas. One is the actual grants portfolio itself. What I heard from council is what is this made up of, etc. And I'm going to give you a high level overview of that. And I'm also going to describe some of the bioinformatics activities. Often at council you hear about bioinformatics and it pops up in various grants or we end up helping with certain grants or there's something related to data. So here I'm trying to coalesce those activities and give you an understanding of what that looks like from an overview perspective of bioinformatics. And those areas I'm going to cover are really the consulting services that we do specifically inside NHGRI and also some trans NIH activities because obviously informatics is a fairly broad topic. So looking first at the actual grants portfolio. So here we have the matrix of a whole collection of program offices. And uh, this program is managed by many people. And the fonts relate to the number and size of grants, those with larger fonts. We have a larger number of grants and and soon as the size of the portfolio. But there's quite a large number of people that work with this. And again, it covers a different range of skill sets from those folks that have very strong informatics skills in the computing areas, right through to the biological areas who are our implementers of bioinformatics tools. Now I want to talk a little bit about what we describe about the types of bioinformatics grants. And they really break into two categories. And these are the ones I'm going to describe today. The first one is primary bioinformatics. That is grants that are primarily computational. Their focus is entirely computational. It has very little uh, laboratory work in it. There may be some grants that have some of this in it, but the focus is computational method development, algorithms, representation, curation of data, representation of that, uh, and presentation of that particular information. I'm going to go through each one of these subcategories as I go through the presentation. The second thing I want to talk about is the component informatics. And as all things, categories are a little hard to sometimes enumerate, but this is our first attempt at doing this. Component bioinformatics, what I mean here is where you've got a grant where the computational component is not the main focus. There's often a very strong laboratory component, technology component, but what we're seeing is an increasing amount of where informatics is included in these grants, and that is not obviously unsurprising. So first I'm going to talk about the primary bioinformatics grants, those which are really focused around uh, computational biology, where their main focus is computational. And the areas I'm going to first look at is the model organism databases, or the MODs, and the enabling technologies, which I'll describe in, minute, in the next few slides. So this institute has had a long history of funding the MODs, and we've also had an increasing number of enabling technologies. These enabling technologies I'll explain in a little minute, but essentially these are things that enable us to look, move, manage, organize, view data that is not necessarily related to a model, though it can include that, but more broadly around biological information. All of these grants are very large-scale informatics grants, and um, from the perspective of NHGRI, these are the U41s, P41s, U01, and P01s. So what are these? Essentially, the MODs uh, are the ones that we fund or partially fund at NHGRI are ZFIN, OMIM, Flybase, 
uh, SGD, the yeast database, MGI, the mouse database, Wormbase, and RGD. And all of these really focus around looking at highly curated data, integrating data sets and sets of genes, proteins, variants, alleles, phenotypes, and genetic disorders for a particular type of model organism. And yes, I realize that I'm suggesting that OMIM is a model organism of human, but it's, uh, I guess we could see it that way. The key thing here, though, is that all of them have that collectively, they do the same thing as what I'm saying in point one. They also provide a common nomenclature for gene symbols and anatomic terms. So that's the curation component, but they also all provide methodologies for search, analysis, and visualization of their data to be able to actually explore that. And they've actually been working more on that as time goes on. Also, historically, in terms of NHGRI, most of these mods have been focused individually on a particular organism, but increasingly what we're finding is we're looking at integration of these particular data sets because obviously these uh, particular data sets form a mosaic for looking at uh, the human genome and human disease. The Enabling Bioinformatics Technologies, as I mentioned before, is a broad collection of, of tools that we fund. Uh, this category has grown quite significantly over the last couple of years, which I think really shows the need for that. And I think it can be encapsulated by what I, the statement I'm making here, which is it's a way to enable easier access, particularly to those folks who are not computing specialists, who don't know how to code. So there are tools in here that enable those biologists to be able to better access this information. But also the broader community, including informaticians, that allow some level of integration, development of in visualization or representation of that information, also management of genomic data and tools. And I think this is a reflection of the needs inside the community for both the biomedical scientists that don't have coding uh, abilities, but also the need to be able to integrate these data and develop systems to allow us to view this kind of information in a cohesive sense. This particular portfolio is managed, as I mentioned, you show here up on the right, by a large number of program offices, and the names are just listed there. And then below, these are the current ones that we fund, and just a couple of examples of these. So I'll describe, say, Uniprot, which is a collection of protein information uh, which is represent curated and represented across all model organisms, but also human and other uh, resources. And it shows a highly curated set of proteins and has visualization tools into those set. Galaxy, many of you might have heard of that. Uh, it's a collection, it's an annotation system for genomic data. It allows a lot of biologists, biomedical scientists that don't have coding experience to be able to go in and create a set of analyses that enables them to do the kind of analyses they wouldn't be able to do unless they had coding skills. HGNC, the Human Genome Nomenclature Consortium, an idea of creating a consensus around nomenclature of genes so that what you call one gene is exactly the same as whatever somebody calls it out on the other side of the pond. Uh, Bioconductor, I think that came up this morning. So Bioconductor is a collection of the R statistical tools, right? So this originally was started for looking at microarray data, but it's moved on to look at SNP analysis and other next-gen sequencing data, and it's become a very large uh, collection of these tools, which is used by many inside mm -hmm. the community, and it's getting bigger as we speak. So I just wanted to highlight a few of these. These are just examples of the kinds of technologies that we support that are all very strongly computational, that are both useful as uh, resources to the community, but also require a tremendous amount of informatics development underneath to supply this to the actual community. <coughs> Moving on to another subsection of what we call primary bioinformatics grants, we have variation analysis and association. This program is managed primarily by Lisa Brooks and Erin Ramos. And here we're looking at the development of methods for analyzing genetic variation and association studies. An example of a program here is Thousand Genomes. And the kinds of work that this group is looking at is discovery of genetic variation, linkage studies, population genetics, admixtures, and variation databases. Quite broad, but it's quite a large area in our portfolio. Now we come to a collection of things which I'm actually calling related to other biological areas. Obviously, when we're actually looking at grants that come into uh, NHGRI, we think about them from a biological perspective as well as computing. So these, there's a collection of grants which really fall into some loose biological areas, and the ones I've enumerated here. Gene regulation, next-gen sequencing data analyses, genome annotation, clinical informatics, gene expression, networks, pathways and systems, and biomedical ontologies. And I'm just going to 
go through those very briefly. Most of these grants are investigator-initiated grants. They're smaller, they're usually R01s, R21s, uh, some conference grants and some SBIRs. Uh, it's managed by a collection of the program offices shown here on the right. And this covers a whole collection of things that we get in. This can cover things like genome assembly, type data, uh, tools, base calling tools, uh, comparative genomics uh, type tools. I've seen a lot of folks coming in with using next-gen sequencing um, data and actually trying to do uh, comparative genomic analysis across different species, looking at strain variant information. We're seeing an increasing number of tools around privacy and encryption, and also modeling. Uh, there's quite a lot of modeling involved in here too as well. We also cover a fairly large range in what we would call broadly genome annotation, and by that I mean gene prediction type methods, genome annotation pipelines, um, phylogeny, and visualization processes like the UCC genome browser, things like that. The last in this category that is entirely computational is that what we call the DACs, or the Data Analysis and Coordination Centers. These DACs provide support services to specific projects, so the most active ones right now are H3 Africa and ENCODE, but uh, we've also been involved with common fund projects where uh, we've also been managing those. The example there was the Human Microbiome Project. The DACs are particularly involved in a collection of things, and I've just enumerated those here. That is, the development of data pipelines, the development of metadata standards, the storage of the raw data and the drive data. Sometimes, not always, the data is uh, put through to EBI and NCBI, so there's all the involvement of submission to that. And it's also, they provide a provision or a website for that particular project to get easy access to data, tools, SOPs, etc. And it also takes a significant portion of, of staff time. This is the, the stuff that happens underneath that is absolutely essential for a project to run and takes quite a considerable amount of time of the informatics staff time to actually do this. And in this case, uh, we provide some funding or complete funding, for example, for ENCODE for these particular programs. So here I just want to give you a couple of summaries and a little like Jeff Schloss this morning, I was just going to present them to you in two particular flavors. One is the list. And in the areas that I've just shown you out here, for the primary informatics, the key thing here is that it's quite a large component of the portfolio. I'm showing 2012 and 2000, 2013 numbers. And then for the component informatics, it's about 7.6 and going up to about 11 million in 2013. So these numbers uh, of 103.7 uh, is for the 2012 and 100.6 for 2013. Here's the same data, just represented in a slightly different way. Uh, showing that the majority of the portfolio really forms within bio, uh, primary bioinformatics, but we've got a reasonably growing component in the component bioinformatics, which isn't surprising to me given the kind of things that we're expecting to see in our organization. All right, moving along now to other bioinformatics staff activities. So the consulting services that we do. So what we do is we provide technical advice on grants that include computing components, we provide an understanding of the connectivity with NCBI and EBI resources and people. I'm frequently asked about, I have some data and I've heard of this geo, or what do I need to do with geo, as an example. There was, uh, for those at council, I think over about a year ago, there was the issue with the submission to SRA. And so there's a lot of work done into the submission of SRA. There's obviously new schemas that come out from that. So being able to translate the meaning of that to the actual POs here and understanding how to get those data from those particular programs into those resources is part of what we do. And that also includes dbGaP. And a fair amount of chunk of time has also been put towards specific programs, for example, here the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. There's been a lot of work done, particularly by Chris Wellington, with data, meta, data and metadata structure and the submissions to NCBI. Again, it's mostly because we have those skill sets to be able to enable the other program offices to understand what is needed in these particular programs. All right, I'm now going to turn to the Trans NIH Bioinformatics activities. These fall into a couple of different flavors. Um, the first one is interactions with NCBI. Uh, the second one is projects with other ICs. I'm not going to have a slide on that, but I'll just tell you, this is the work that Heidi Safira is doing with TCGA. So it's helping other programs and providing the informatics support, input, and advice on those kind of programs. BISTI, which is uh, a group within NIH that looks at biomedical computing 
and some initiatives, which is the NSF NIH uh, Big Data Initiative, and a little bit about BD2K. So looking firstly at NCBI, uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work in actually working with NCBI. And here we're looking at tracking sequence data and metadata from various sequencing programs and projects at NHGRI and looking at their deposition uh, into NCBI. This is often working with the sequencing centers. They're doing the direct deposition, but we're actually looking at where that data is being deposited at NCBI and how it's represented. And more importantly, can we actually find it after we've actually submitted to NCBI? Which leads to the second point, which is bioproject pages for the various NHGRI programs. Bioprojects are a way of representing information, scientific, and the various data types that are actually associated with particular projects. The first one that we set up there was the Human Microbiome Project. This is a collaboration between myself and Lita Proctor and Chris Wellington and NCBI to develop actually a page that shows you the different data that was generated for the project, the science, where to get the information, where to get the data, and how to find it easily. And myself and Chris Wellington have been working hard on doing the same sort of bioproject pages that represent other programs within NHGRI. The idea here is to enable the community to better easily find the data and hopefully to be able to use it. Another thing that I've been working on with NCBI, I think you've heard about the cloud a few occasions and there are certainly council members here who are using it or actively using it, supporting it. I've been working with NCBI on data and tools and the representation of that within the cloud. They have a large chunk of this data already on Amazon and Google and I've had quite a lot of discussions with Don Proust and um, Jim Ostell about how they've been doing this and the value of that to biomedical data. And the last one, which is the one that's coming up more recently, but I think as you've seen from other council presentations, the uh, use of variant information. So we're starting to work a lot more with ClinVar and dbSNP and the representation of that data, the flow of that data from various resources and awards that have been made by NHGRI into these particular resources. The principle is the same thing. We want to be able to get the data in there in an efficient uh, way that is represented correctly and it makes biological sense and it's easy for the community to be able to access this information. Those are our goals. So these are all the hidden things that, that happen, but I think it's what makes the data extremely useful and usable to the community. Next thing that we do <coughs> is related to BISTI. BISTI is the Biomedical Information Science and Technology Initiative. It's a consortium of representatives from each of the NIH institutes and centres. This was started back in 1999, 2000, for, which was a report written, I believe, by David Botstein and others as um, advisory committee to the director about the needs of computational sciences within NIH. And that report embodied a collection of things which were suggestions of how we would actually consider dealing with computational issues at NIH. And that consortium of uh, <coughs> people in NIH is primarily program officers, but it, there are additional folks that actually come to these meetings. And we focus on the discussions related to biomedical computing. The focuses of those discussion can be around the development of FOAs. For those of you who submit to NIH, there are a collection of program announcements that are specifically related to the development of computational tools or the further development of computational tools. But we also have presentations around certain technologies. Uh, for example, we've had natural language processing. I gave a presentation on the cloud. We've had various information science technologies represent. And so we get a better understanding of the kinds of technologies that will impact us when we try and deal with biomedical data, use it, and also to act as program officers inside NIH so that we can actually act as advocates across NIH to better educate our various colleagues. The trans NIH activity here I'm highlighting is the NIH NSF Big Data Initiative. This was done in 2012. This was a joint solicitation between NIH and NSF. It has the institutes that I've enumerated up there. We were one of those. Uh, the solicitation was an attempt to try and bring these two agencies together. NSF traditionally focuses on pretty hardcore compute support structure, and NIH does not. So coming together was a very timely pursuit because I think we both had a real need for doing this. The initiative that came up was this one, which is called Core Techniques and Technologies for Advancing Big Data Science and Engineering. And the key take home message here was to be able to make collections of large data tools easily more accessible to the community or developing methods for doing exactly that. And I think it was a very interesting first round. 
I think the key thing here that was really interesting was that working with another agency which is involved in heavy duty computing, merging with some of our discussions, I think we had a better understanding of what that community has been building and they got a better understanding of the kinds of needs that we actually had. So I think it was a very helpful and opportune time to consider having a look at this. The last thing I want to highlight is the BD2K. I think you heard Eric Green discuss that this morning in his director's report. Uh, this is the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, and it breaks down into four primary areas, data sharing and standards, software methods and systems for analysis, training, and centers of excellence for big data analysis. Uh, the various program offices listed here and also analysts, uh, the folks who are actually been working on this particular initiative, we either co-chair some of these groups or are particularly involved in heavily working with other groups in these areas. And this is proving also to be it's uh, time consuming, but I think it's very relevant to the mission of NHGRI, and I certainly think we need to be involved in this from the perspective of our own better understanding of how the community is dealing with these issues and also being involved from our own perspective of what we do within NHGRI. So from that, I get to my end. And here I realize that I've spelt it in the Australian way rather than the American way. So you'll have to take my acknowledgement for that. Um, I'd like to thank our advisory group. Here we have a small group of council members that have bioinformatics experience and skills that range from development to the end user. And I think it's very important that we get that broad perspective. And they provide advice on various bioinformatic issues that affect NHGRI. And they've been extremely helpful in going through the presentation that I gave you today and providing advice on what you guys might be interested in hearing. And our council members represented here are Carlos Bustamante, Jill Mezrov, Bob Nussbaum, and Lucilla Ono Machado. Uh, they've also kindly agreed after this council to look at additional topics as we move forward to figure out what we need to bring to council. And when we get to the conclusion of this presentation, it would be very interesting to hear from council what other things you would like to see. I'd also like to add an additional acknowledgement, also with an E, to my fellow uh, program officers and also to Javel Goldner, who's been working hard on a lot of these spreadsheets. And I'd also like to make a very special thank you to Chris Wellington, who has been heavily involved in a lot of the analysis of the spreadsheets and has been trying to do bioinformatics in Excel, which is, for those of you who know what that means, uh, it can be rather complex and um, challenging, I think is the right word. So with that, I'll end. I hope that's given you a general understanding of what we do. It's a very high level overview, but it's my first attempt at trying to figure out how do we actually present to you what our program is about, what's in it, and how do we do what we do. So now I'd like to open that up to questions and see how we could improve our next round. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Questions, comments? Just what you wanted. You guys said you wanted a good summary of our bioinformatics portfolio. Yeah, and, and thank you, Vivian. That, that, that was very, very helpful. And of course, it, as uh, we start to maybe understand a little better, our questions maybe arise. I, um, I was struck with, when you're talking about the trans NIH things, um, if Beastie, which started what in Bisti, yep. Bisti and, and, and uh, like around 2000, then you got big, uh, big data, and then we got big data <laughs> to knowledge, and, 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 but they all sound similar to me in a, in a very way. And I just wondered, is, that a, a, is there some continuity, some learning, some linking uh, uh, among these trans NIH initiatives? Yeah, many of, so Bisti was started, as I said, as an attempt to try and coalesce the issues around computational biology. And, what came out of that was uh, certainly some program announcements, right? And in BD2K, we're looking at furthering those, we're looking at developing those, leveraging what we've already learned from BISTI. So there's an example where we've taken that further. Uh, some of the things that were suggested in that original report uh, that were put in place into BISTI are being extended in, into BD2K. And there are many program offices that are part of BISTI that are also part of BD2K. And so I think we've spent a lot of time learning and developing further than that. I think Mark's going to add something. Yeah. Just to add a little bit, but BISTI um, in general was much more voluntary on the part of the institutes. 
<laughs> some, some institutes participated in the program announcements, some didn't. Most of those, they're, they're mostly focused on R01 type grants and in a sense investigator initiated, although sometimes program announcements are considered solicitation. BD2K is much more actively programmed and much more directed at a specific issue of, uh, of big data. Even though, and Jill can comment on this, the, the report from the Data and Informatics Working Group of the Advisory Committee to the Director on which BD2K was based um, really sort of morphed in over the course of the uh, um, report from big data to all data. Um, but but the, the big, as it's being implemented, the initial focus is really on large data sets. Yeah, I would I would add too that if you look at the um, BD2K Centers of Excellence RFA that went out, you'll see great similarity between that and the BISD NCBC centers. Um, in our report, we tried to point out some ways in which we thought that could be improved. Um, and, I, you know, I, look, I, I think the main thing is that when David Botstein and I think it was Larry Smarr, wasn't it, wrote the BISTI report, yeah. I don't know how many years ago, um, they foresaw exactly the same issues that are pressing on us now. And so it's not surprising in many ways that there is some overlap in the ideas and the concerns. And, and I think both BISTI and the BD2K report, as it's called, are just trying to point out that we're in an age where computation has to be taken seriously. And these are some ways in which that can be done. And that, as Mark points out, it started out as the big data problem, but in fact it's a much broader all data <laughs> issue. It, it's, it's as much the complexity of the data that we deal with as it is the amount of data that we deal with. I don't think the problems have gone away. I think there's similar problems. I think what's becoming even more urgent is the fact that with such large data sets, you need to have the ability to access and analyze those. And you've got the folks that have computational skills, but what you need to do is get into the hands of folks that don't have those. So what we're seeing, especially in some of our enabling technologies, is tool sets and systems which permit the biomedical scientists without those coding skills to do exactly that. Access the data in an environment that's supporting of large data sets and can actually deal with it. Um, and the second thing is to give them tools to be able to do their analysis. That's something that we're seeing it was pressing before and it's incredibly urgent now. Yeah, and I would also just add what I think was a critical point in the, in the report of the Data Informatics Working Group is that um, <clears throat> being successful here is going to require considerable culture change at NIH. The culture changes being to, to take computational uh, issues seriously, to actually spend money um, supporting that, that seriousness, and, and, and then the whole issue of data sharing, making data accessible, uh, so forth. and, and um, my, my sense is that BD2K, through BD2K and through the appointment of Associate Director for Data Science, there's a much more active um, approach at the NIH level than there has been in the past. I think one of the things that we see is an increasing number of grants where the focus isn't computational, right? And they're wanting to use those technologies to be able to better do whatever they're going to do biologically in the laboratory or technology development. So I think that's going to be pretty important that we know how to deal with that and acknowledge that exists. And how do we find out how do we support that community? How do we get access to the tools? And how do we fund those kinds of things? So I don't think this came up earlier, but if it did, uh, excuse me, um, 
if it did and I missed it. How is this all interacting um, with the, you know, administration-wide directive to come up with plans for making publicly funded data available? Um, it, I assume that there's a very direct interaction with that administration-wide kind You're of. Talking about the OSDP memo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, uh, Mark. I don't know if you want to address that. That definitely within the context of BD2K, that's becoming incredibly apparent. Uh, you want to make all the data accessible and findable, and I think uh, some of the things that I gave an example before for NCDI, making sure that the project page is there so that data is findable and locatable, is another example within the context of what I gave. Do you want to add anything to that, Mark, in terms of? So I was just going to say that um, there's a group at NIH that has developed our plan to respond to the OSTP memo, and on that um, planning group are members of several members of the BD2K initiative, as well as NHGRI is sitting on it, and several other institutes that have major <coughs> stakes and history and experience in developing the data sharing plan, so that we can try to coordinate across the board. So we're we're definitely keeping track of that and very connected to what's happening, so that we can talk to each other. Basically, <laughs> I, I, um, many of these uh, algorithm development software tools are major investment for NHGRI, especially the extramural projects. And in reading some of the reviews, there was concern that that there wasn't enough usage of these tools. And I wasn't sure whether all the onus was on the investigators to kind of market and get people to use them, or is there some sort of partnership with the Institute in trying to showcase your investments and getting people to use the tools? Because obviously something at a, at a, at a university is only going to get so much traffic to, for people to know it's there, where NHGRI has much, probably a lot more hits in a day. So is that an issue, or is it something that you've thought about? Yes, and I can answer that in a couple of ways. Um, so we have a U41, which is uh, Community Genomics Resources. And the enabling technologies that I described today, one of the key issues there is high utility to the community. So they have to be able to demonstrate that, reach out to the communities, and really work hard at that. It is also something we look at very strongly when we look at these grants in their annual reports, et cetera. But there is also a need for folks that develop tools that aren't necessarily going to push it out to the community just yet. right? They're developing new methodologies, which they're just simply testing out to figure out, do they work? And I think we need to support those kinds of things. So it's a balance between those kinds of issues. And I think that's really important. Jill? So I, I think Tony was making a somewhat different point, and that is that, yes, the onus right now is on the tool developers, the system developers, the database developers to do all their own marketing and to make whatever connections have to be made. And, you know, I, th I think it would be an additional way to support these groups that NIH is, that NHGRI is supporting with funds to also help with that endeavor. I'm not um, suggesting, there, there haven't in the past been projects where institutes have said if you're responding to this RFA, then you must show us that you're using this particular other project that we fund. So I'm not saying that. But I think you're right that there probably are some good ways that NHGRI could help with the marketing and help with the visibility of some of the good tools that, that are developed with NHGRI funds. One of the discussions inside BD2K, I think you heard about it this morning, was the data catalog. There's also a discussion of a software catalog, which is the ability to locate, find uh, software which has been developed by NIH. And the idea behind that is so that it's not stuck on a PI's website, but it's easily findable. And so that people can find this information in a way that will help them decide whether they can use or want to use the tool, be able to contact the developer and actually do that. So there are ways that it's also being permeated in uh, more recent events. And I would, I would just note that the data catalog and software catalog, <coughs> the plans for that are a direct response to the first recommendation of the Data Informatics Working Group, which was exactly that for the purpose of getting um, uh, much more uh, widespread usage of existing data sets, new data sets, software. And it, but it's also a, a, a way, potentially, if it's done right, 
for uh, data generators and software developers to get more credit because they, the, they will be able to cite usage and we'll be able to start collecting usage information through the, through the data catalog. I just sent out the link to Gene Space to my lab to advertise. <laughs> <coughs> but to the question, I wanted to explore this interaction with NSF because we were funded, unlike probably most of the council members, by equally by NSF and, and NIH. And we use um, actually some, you know, when we're asked, we're, so we have a significant compute um, capacity, but when we, when we are overloaded, we go to, you know, Big Iron in Texas. And they want to know, you know, which NSF grant I'm going to assign this to. And sometimes, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I have one that I can point to. And boy, I'd like to run some of my NIH project mm -hmm. mapping, on um, algorithm testing on some of their new, uh, on some of their big iron. Mm -hmm. How did that interaction look? Because that there are resources that I can get there that are that are tremendous, you know, in terms of the the power that they have. And I. <clears throat> And, I, and it's not so seamless, actually, in terms of crossing agencies. I'd agree. In the terms of what I showed up here, it didn't have anything to do with that. But what it did enable me to do was to have conversations with NSF program officers to discuss exactly this. And there are things in the work at the moment where we're going to meet with various supercomputing facilities around the country and also cloud providers, uh, both academic and commercial, we're interested in figuring out how do we support the big iron that's needed for doing the big data analysis? So for example, if I understand you correctly, you don't want to set up a big iron facility, but you want to use something. And if it's funded by NSF, how do you get access to that and at what cost? And that is exactly the kind of thing we're looking at because the big data, the big data issues are that you need something to be able to work on that way. And we don't want to fund something, we want to reuse things. And so I think those conversations are occurring now and we want to figure out what technologies we have to look at. Yeah, we, we have tried to interact with the supercomputing centers in the past. It hasn't been necessarily successful, but in, in most recently it has been, and it's been very productive. In fact, you know, we can do a lot of things with them that in, a, you know, in just a fraction of the time we can on our own machines. And, you know, in the past it's always been some interface issue. We couldn't find the right person. But some of these places actually do have the right people now that, you can work with and get, get what you need done. So in the conversations I've had very recently with a, a number of supercomputing centers, they were extremely excited to be able to talk to us for exactly the reason you've just said. They want to be able to figure out how do we work together? Is there a way to deal with this? Can we leverage that? What's the right way to do it? So the conversation is, the timing is now. And I think with the, such, the large data sets that are available, pushes that conversation further down the track. So thank you for bringing that up. You just gave us um, a two-year snapshot of the funding, and it looked largely like it was it was static year to year. I'm curious on the overall balance of methodology support versus tool support, or make, uh, making software available to people. Do you feel like you've got the balance about right, and will you keep it about the same? I'm not sure I understand. Development of new methods, yep. algorithms, approaches versus software that exists and facilitating access to that software by biomedical investigators. Do we think we've got the balance right? Yes. It's a constant challenge. I'm not sure if the balance is right yet, but we're aware that we have to support both. So I don't have a better answer than that other than we're aware of it and we need to look at it a bit more deeply. I, I know that it's in the back of my mind at all times, which is what are we supporting for development of methods and that which is out there. Um, then there's the issue too that you're constantly supporting these resources and you don't have additional funds for new things. Yeah. That's another aspect of it as well. Not a good answer, but I, it's something we're certainly considering and thinking heavily about. If you have any suggestions, very helpful to us. I raised it just because I have a concern. The tendency often is to take it away from developing new approaches and thinking about the problems and just to put it into tools, and I think that's a risk, but it doesn't look like it's a problem just yet. We're very aware of it, absolutely. <laughs> Carlos? So um, I want to thank you for putting that together. I mean, I think it. it for me, it's incredibly useful to, to get a sense. And, and just to echo that, it's a really tough problem in that you're supporting things that run basically from <coughs> almost what physicists use, command line tools, all the way through, you know, what could be EHR and interactions with things like Epic, which often cost hundreds of millions of dollars to install in the first place, right? So uh, I guess my question to follow up on, on your question is that 
if we think about what the sweet spot is, right, in terms of what we envision in terms of the bioinformatics program, do you want to get tools to the point that they become commercialized? Because in bioinformatics, that's not often very easy. Or do you want to create tools that are good enough so that you know, a good set of analysts could take them on, say, like the way GATK has been produced, or is it more to develop the ideas with the th thought that because the science is moving so quickly, in fact, we don't really need to be thinking about a software development cycle like MS Word, where we're going to have programs that we're going to be supporting for 10 or 15 years. So I'm, I'm just curious your thought, your sort of big picture thoughts in that regard and, and others, because I, 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 I don't think it's an easy thing to sort out, because there are a lot of technical and, and... I think you need to think about it across that entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, you need to have balance. So I think you're going to have, as you were saying before, you need to have development of those tools. You need to get them also particularly with so many biomedical scientists not coding and don't necessarily need to, you need to have tools that you can, the term we use is hardening, right, to get them out to the community. So we need initiatives that deal with that as well uh, for current tools, but we also need to leave the space for new tools that think about things in new and interesting ways to get it into the hands of the biomedical scientist. So you could use the same old stuff, but you also need to think about new innovative ways of delivering that information based on the science that you're trying to do. I'd say, although data integration is one of the key things, I'd say it's even more imperative now yeah. in being able to do that. And I think the difference that we're seeing with some of the data integration pieces is, in the past, people would try and make interoperability at the base level of the data and try to make everything match as you were trying to look at different data sets. We're now realizing you can't do that because the volume of the data is too huge. So you have to essentially take a data science mining approach as one way to think about that to do that. So I think we have to cover that whole spectrum and we need to think about how we need to do that in the context of balancing our priorities in NHGRI. And then we absolutely need to be able to talk to the community to find out what's needed out there in the community as well. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I wonder if we're reaching a stage in bioinformatics and particularly of genomic data similar to the what we see in the development of sequencing technologies, where the role of the funded entities is to get it to a point where it can then take on a life outside of what is the traditional, either NHGRI funding or the universities. I mean, just because, you know, truth be told, right, you know, universities aren't particularly good at the engineering side or the software development side. We can take it to a certain point, but, you know, you'd, you'd rather let people who do that really, really well take that on. And I think, in bioinformatics, there just hasn't been a lot of money to be made. But you can imagine that now, potentially, we're reaching a point where that could be. I'm just curious what other people think, I mean, in terms of that investment, right? We, w we wouldn't fund somebody to build a sequencer, right? We'd fund them to develop the technology to get it to that point. And the thing that's always kind of weird is that the ones that do build the sequencing often then have really crappy bioinformatics to support the sequencer that then kind of comes back to us it's to not a business develop. Imperative, right? So, anyway. Vivian, do you want to um, sort of add to your answer by talking about a, li a little bit about what BD2K offers as an opportunity to, um, to address these kinds of questions, rather than just talking about NHGRI? Um, sure. Or do you want to take the lead on that, <laughs> since you're the BD2K czar? <laughs> I, I was thinking in part about the, the software development component of BD2K. Uh, focusing on underserved areas yep. of okay. software development and opportunity for uh, new tool development in areas that uh, that historically have not been uh, well supported, and also the role of uh, <coughs> the centers in taking the tools they develop and further than than uh, perhaps. Uh, groups have in the past. Sure. So to add to Mark, um, in the context of BD2K in terms of the software, um, let me step back a little bit. When BISD was developed, uh, the two main program announcements there were related to if you're developing some software and it's brand new, there's a collection of R01s, R21s, etc. And then if you've already developed something and you want to maintain it or further develop that, that was the other set of FOAs that were available. 
in BD2K, we realized BISTI still does that, and it's great, but we want to grow that. There are very clearly underserved areas um, that we really need to look at, things like compression, which don't really impact the biology in the sense of the actual biological question, but pre-processing and filtering of data. For example, there are some grants that we now fund that look at filtering of very large data sets before you do an assembly. Now, where would they get that funded in the past? It's not really a methods development because it kind of gets applied to biological data. It's something that might get thrown over an NSF. And so this is where the line is bordering. And so there's an example where at BD2K, we're trying to capture these things, which I guess move more in the line of computing that's very strongly supporting of biology. So if we have a continuum of computing here and biology here, we're moving, I guess, to the left a little bit which is a good thing because you need those computing support systems in software and hardware to do that, which I think you were just pointing out before. Uh, uh, can I make a comment also that I think as we talked about genomic medicine in application in clinical practice, the uh, integration with electronic health records in, in other areas it has traditionally been apart from the computational biology and other uh, aspects, but the uh, also tying into the privacy of human genome and everything. I think there, it's a point where uh, medicine clearly meets biology, yep. and computation is right in the middle of it. S but but there is a tremendous lack of um, applications, tools, and even environments to support that data in a HIPAA-compliant manner. One of the areas that we're noticing a lot of is you've got a biological scientist who has a tremendous amount of data and may actually know how to use it, but they don't have access to big iron, right? They don't have s compute systems locally to do that. So what do they do? And this is where you were just describing before about moving to supercompute facilities. A trend that I'm noticing is people using AWS, which is Amazon, right? Uh, why? Because you can quickly set up a VM up on that run your analysis, and for very little cost, analyze a tremendous amount of data. Bring it down, and you don't have to incur any computing costs. So we're seeing people leveraging these technologies to be able to do their science, and we need to sort of think about the impact of those things. I think yeah. it's something we should look at. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, in fact, one of the things we've done in 1,000 Genomes is we've partnered with AWS and then even AWS Revendor. So we, we have a collaboration with DNA Nexus where they've ported a bunch of our pipelines and they can produce call sets incredibly quickly, which we think is great, you know. And again, it sort of gets to that sort of what I would call the sweet point where, you know, if they want to then repackage it and, you know, make it available to other people, then from our perspective, that's great. It gets our tools out there and we don't have to worry about building a system to do that. Right, so you know we can then focus on what I consider that we're good at, which is the methods development part and getting a, an implementation, and not the sort of distribution channels and all the kinds of things that are much more what you know companies should do. Right. Part of the problem we, that we come up with too is that when people go into review with grants, which are resources, they often get dinged on the innovation component, right? Because it's a resource, so it's not as cool and innovative as something else. Yeah. But it's an absolute essential need for the community. So the current system supports the development of these technologies and resources up to a point. The question becomes, how do you move that potentially into a commercial market, which is viable both in terms of a business plan, but it still, at the, at the same time, is respectful to what NH needs to do? And I think that's, that's a nexus that we need to figure out how to handle. I think there's going to be some issues here with public-private partnerships, which we're going to have to look into, simply as people are using either supercompute facilities, clouds, or whatever. Those are the things we're going to have to consider. So we've reached the point where we're criticizing peer review, and I'm going to save us from <laughs> sailing over the abyss. I will give Jeff the last comment. Not about peer review, but well, maybe it is. Um, <laughs> it, it's that we're we've I've often heard that while people don't mind paying for uh, buying a sequencing machine and buying kits, that they expect their bioinformatics tools to be free. Uh, and and that play, so that plays into is there a market? Go ahead, Mark. Detail, I think, commenting on the slide Vinyard showed about the NHGRI staff who have been involved in BD2K, I don't think I saw Betty Graham's name on there, and I just wanted to make sure that 
Betty got credit. Betty is one of the co-leads of the training component, yes. surprise, surprise, and uh, has been uh, doing a lot of work on that. It was a test. Sorry, Betty. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Vivian. Thank Wonderful you presentation. All right. We're going on to the last presentation of the day, which is by uh, Heather Junkins. She's the co-director of the NHGRI Training and Career Development Program, and she's going to present NHGRI's proposed plans to expand our current training program. And I'll, because we're getting near the end of time here and we have a hard stop to get you downtown, I'm going to remind the council we have a closed session, uh, a period of time in closed session to discuss the training component as well. So 